Greetings to everybody on the Tape Network. This is December 12, 1988, and this tape will be a group of highlights from adventures across country that Tom and I took in 1980. This is by request from Paul, who asked for uh, some more recollections of adventures on the freight trains. So on this tape, I'll focus on uh, actual archive material that relates to freights. So let's get right started here. Apologize for the tape quality, um, but here it is. It's, uh, what, Tuesday, the 16th of September, 1980. And we're looking out at blue skies and old rundown shacks as they roll by. A little bit ago, some other hobos hopped on the same train, waiting under an, uh, an overpass, holding their bedrolls. Nothing else but an old blankets, all they had. We got these two backpacks full of gear. <laughs> Sketchbooks and cameras and shoes and all kinds of food. Why, they think we're millionaires in the hobo ring. So here we go. A six weeks of adventure. And that's how it began. With a burst of enthusiasm that always accompanies hopping on any freight, we, we set off on the rattling old steel uh, freight. And our backpacks were a, a pipe, some pipe tobacco, harmonicas, Jews harp, crummy 50 cent camera, which actually took great pictures. Each of us had a tape recorder with an on off switch. <laughs> <laughs> A big Tupperware full of a mixture of honey and peanut butter, <laughs> <laughs> which we figured would give us high nutrition for those long jaunts between um, between grocery stores. Uh, let's continue with a little bit of harmonica music. <laughs> boxcar a few ahead of us and uh, we asked him uh, where he's headed he said he's going out to Yuma Arizona this side of Phoenix where he's gonna work in a mill uh, some kind of mill he told us there was harvest work out in Phoenix if we wanted it and uh, looked like a pretty nice old guy he told us how to find the work but I don't know if we'll be doing it we'll see you just heard was a Mexican hobo looking for work in Yuma uh, who got off the train when the train stopped. We're sitting in the yard now. After we talked to him, we've just been uh, walking down to this little shack where we washed our hands and uh, talked to a, an older guy who's been working here 30 years and isn't too crazy about his job. Now it's dark. The sun set in a magnificent uh, display of orange and light underneath the clouds, it's incredible. And uh, we sat down to sketch it. I went up on a bluff and Tom sat beneath the trains uh, and started a sketch, but a security guard stopped next to him. And um, anyway, here's the scene now. It's dark, the engine connected to our train which is supposedly to believe at about 10 o'clock is going to take us to Phoenix. That engine's still there, I think. But uh, we're sitting holed up in this boxcar, the second one we're in, the, the second one we've been in. And uh, the, the guy with the, in the car has, uh, oh, Tom says he's coming by again. He keeps driving by in his, in his car and uh, shining lights in the boxcars. So, uh, oh no, there he goes right now, right this very minute, driving by again. But um, anyway, I think he's looking for us. We're going to stay in here and uh, risk it until we can take off for Phoenix. Nothing but a long, frustrating wait since my last entry. 
We thought this train was leaving the Phoenix, but it isn't. And it's been sitting here, and trains been going by both east and west while we've uh, sat here in the dark, eating, sleeping, and mostly waiting. So right now the sun's come up and it's early morning, and we're gonna pack up and uh, either head out past the yard and catch the first eastbound train that's going slow enough to hop, we're gonna go up to the freeway and hitch out of here. But in either case, we're getting out of this hell hole and finding our way to Phoenix. Well, as you can see, the train's rolling. Right now, we're hitching up uh, the same train that we were on. In fact, we're in the same boxcar. We walked up and got uh, some water and uh, washed our face and everything. And uh, we started to wait under this overpass and met another tramp named Jerry. He told us a little bit about riding the trains and uh, how he likes to ride grain cars and to watch out for the bull. The bull is the guy that uh, busted Tom yesterday. So if you stay out of the yard, you won't get caught by the bull. Anyway, this train is going to be, when it finishes hitching up, it's going to be taking us out to Phoenix, I hope. But we're just rolling around in this thing and learning a lot about boxcar riding. The guy, Jerry, that we met uh, was unshaven, had very piercing blue eyes and a thin face. He was sitting crouched down. As he said, he was... He hated the L.A. yard because it's impossible to jump a train out here. And uh, they keep, they always lock up the boxcars, they're always moving too fast, and they take too long in the yard. So he was, like most tramps we've met, has been kind of worn out and, uh, and tired and uh, a little bit cynical. Uh, he, he was dressed in uh, blue with uh, big old boots, with nothing but a bedroll and, a, and an open plastic water jug full of water. We met another tramp came along. Uh, we didn't learn his name, but he looked kind of uh, fairly clean shaven at the time. And uh, was had a vest and carrying a, a little bedroll too. And uh, we saw another old man, another tramp, who was carrying a suitcase and just walking back and forth. So the, the word's tramp, not hobo. That's what they call themselves. Well, it looks like we're finally pulling out. We got on this car and it's now starting to roll out of the yard. And as we passed out, moved along, we looked over to the side and we saw a bunch of hobos. Jerry, the guy we were talking to, the other guy with the long sideburns. And then, beyond them, a hobo camp with a big pile of garbage, a little campfire, and about four little four black guys lying around it. A real hobo camp, a bunch of old uh, shacks and everything else. So here we go, on the road to Phoenix. Actually, it was on the road to Yuma. We thought at, the, at that point we'd be going to Phoenix. But most of the time on the trains was spent waiting. Long hours when you'd wait for an engine to come pick up this line of cars. Often we'd be in a section of the train that was set out, which means they would break the train in half and leave half the cars sitting. Well, we're going to have a master it next week. <laughs> we're rolling through the desert of the Imperial Valley on the eastern side, and it's hot. It's about 110 outside. It must be about 120 inside. This place is burning up. Outside, the details make their point in endless repetition. Palm tree after palm tree, telephone pole after telephone pole, occasionally a house or a little town with uh, pickup trucks with fat tires and A&Ws, people's backyards with swing sets. I wouldn't want to live here, but it ain't bad going by on this train as it rattles along. Here's the sound of another train going by outside. It'll be coming up in a minute here. I'm going to hold the microphone right outside so you can hear it go by. It's a big one. Looks like a long one. Everyone out here is carrying freight down to Mexico or into Texas. 
I'm leaning out of the box car over a bunch of hot gravel. And uh, looks like it's sort of moving along slowly. Here you go now. I'm off our own train now and uh, standing beside another train that's rolling by us because I want to get a tape recording for you of the wheels and the creaking sounds as they go by. Here's, here we are, about four inches from the track with a train going right over my head. A billboard a ways back with a picture of a hobo lying down against a tree and it said feel like a vagabond stay in the vagabond motels six miles ahead we're in Nyland right now and they're gonna be setting out 26 cars and uh, we're on one of those 26 so we've got to transfer over to some other car to continue the trip to Yuma it's hot weather out here Desolate country, but I love it. Well, we're back on the original car that we started our trip on, this old box car with a crossbar loading system. And uh, we're just waiting while they set out the rest of the cars. While I was crossing over to get to this one, I had to walk over this gondola, and it was uh, full of big sheets of steel just piled up on the inside of it. and. Uh, I'm telling you, that must have been the hottest thing I've, I've ever encountered. It was like uh, opening up a 400 degree oven when you're cooking some pizza and having that blast of air blow you in the face and singe your eyebrows. That's what it was like, except my whole body was in that oven. My tennis shoes started to melt and I was almost skating on this metal on molten rubber. <laughs> so anyway, we're sitting here cooking it out and uh, ready to head on towards Yuma. First stop, Yuma, Arizona. We woke up from the train, which was just jostling about, like you wouldn't believe, side to side, through desert country, and had not a soul except for the train tracks, and that was it. And uh, the engine guy, the hobo, who said nothing but how to us, jumped off by the river. We jumped off in the central yard and uh, talked to a fella that said that uh, Yuma's not such a bad place if you head downtown and see what happens. Get a couple cold ones, as he says. So we're heading over there to see what'll happen. We're right in the middle of a big rail yard right now, and uh, going to head in and see what happens. When tomorrow or later tonight, we're going to catch the next train east, see what befalls us next. Well, let me recap briefly what happened in Yuma so that I can get back to the train with you. But briefly, uh, Yuma had its ups and downs, but mainly ups. It was a good town for us, treated us well, and it was our first uh, taste of fame and fortune. When we got off the train and walked a little ways, we met an officer who wished us well and actually told us um, where the mission was, which uh, would give us a hot meal and a place to sleep. But when we got there, it all looked so seedy that we decided that it wasn't the place for us. We actually recognized some of the hobos standing in line. There was a guy named Bill, one of the guys we, we you remember from the tape earlier. When he saw us, he goes, <laughs> he goes, what took you so long? <laughs> there were these long lines waiting for the soup kitchen, so we pushed on. Um, but we had an ice cream and a Coke at this um, Chinese deli and uh, got talking to this uh, gal named Susan uh, who told us that uh, it would be okay with her if we used her landlord's hose to take a shower out in her yard. So uh, we took turns hosing each other off and um, got looking pretty decent. We were both covered head to toe with grime. 
Um, later, Susan actually made us hamburgers, and um, we sat in her house and sketched her wicker chair uh, and talked about life and all the rest. And uh, pretty soon, we got the idea of sketching in a bar. Uh, that was our first experience, really, in, in doing bar sketching. Uh, she recommended the back room, which is this one main bar in Yuma. Uh, it was a big congregation point for all the um, Marines on base in Yuma, Arizona. We made what seemed to us then a fortune at the time, $30. Uh, and we sat outside in the empty streets of Yuma counting that money, and it seemed like an infinite amount to us at the time. When you're down that low, man, 30 bucks really seems like a lot. That's a lot of Cheetos, let me tell you, a lot of Cheetos right there. Well, Susan had told us that um, we better not hang around her place too much more because her boyfriend was coming, but also because she had these Snoopy neighbors named Dottie and George. <laughs> so what did we do? We went directly to Dottie <laughs> and George to beg their mercy. And uh, they were really nice. Old George... Um, suggested uh, that we go take a look at the Yuma Daily Sun. And uh, he gave us a couple names. I think they were Bill Worley and uh, Duncan Osborne, a couple of the names of the guy editors at the newspaper. We went in there and told them our story, and uh, they decided to do a feature on us. That involved uh, traveling all over um, Yuma w in the back of George's pickup truck, seeing some of the highlights, the prison, the the big bridge going across, some of the trains. Tom and I did some sketches, and um, one of them ended up in, uh, in this feature article that was done about us. Uh, a woman named Debbie, who was, a, I remember, a very sophisticated uh, uh, intellectual lady, w gave us the interview and really uh, had a lot of skepticism about our, our, our optimistic view of the world. Well, we slept on a park bench that night, and then the next day we went to a mall, and we uh, did some various things. We finally ended up at the Sky Chief, the Sky Chief bar, and had a really good night of sketching people. And I remember this one guy named Roger actually hired me to draw. He was really drunk. He goes, "I'll I'll pay two bucks a shot to draw every every girl in the whole bar." All right, and these he had all these girls. He was egging them on, and he, he had them lined up in front of my drawing sitch. And uh, I did, you know, these sort of Linwood-esque, or I, I attempted Linwood-esque portraits of them. And I discovered in doing them that um, you have to do portraits of women head-on. And um, guys, you can do in profile, but women, you have to do straight on. Well, the next morning then, we, um, uh, George took us over to the on-ramp to Highway 8, where we attempted to hitch a ride. And we planned ahead on this trip for hitchhiking. It involved making a poster that said, World Record <laughs> Guinness World Record Hitchhike Attempt with an American flag on it. We also made a, a giant thumb, as I recall, uh, that would really get across the, uh, the point that we were hitchhiking. All to no avail. In fact, there were some people who drove by on the on-ramp and actually locked their doors when they saw us. Uh, it was incredibly difficult. People would drive by with all the space in their car, big empty pickup trucks, you know. One driver in a giant station wagon. We were the most clean-cut looking guys in uniforms. I don't know what in the world uh, was wrong with our presentation. There was a guy across the road with a slouchy hat and an old pair of blue jeans and just bombed out looking, and he got a ride. Now, you explain to me the reverse psychology there. I'm reading to you now from the... Uh lamp post here at the uh, on-ramp. Uh, some comments written by disillusioned hitchhikers. Six days on this ramp, so I stole a horse. Gone home. Billy Miller. Jim, too. What else do we have here? There are no atheists on freeway on-ramps. <laughs> there are no atheists on freeway on-ramps. That's a good one. I'll tell you, it's made me believe. Homebound like big dogs. Does one learn to, f to get the reason together, something like that? To lose your life? What, what do you read it? Dory was here and now is gone, but leaves her soul to carry on. There she, there she is. She's said it for us. Uh, starting from reality, 
change to some other condition, Krishna. I want to get out of this rotten place. Everybody must get stoned. San Clemente to Phoenix in five days. Okay? A red car just drove by us. Here comes a pickup. This is it. Come on, buddy. And that's hitchhiking. Always hoping that next ride will be the one. So we gave it up and went back to the tracks in hopes of finding maybe another freight train. It was not a desirable option. But we are going to look for it, at least try for it. Here's the scene by the tracks. Oh, I'm standing down here in Hobo Camp, underneath an overpass, next to the eastern side of the Southern Pacific Railway Yard in Yuma, Calif uh, Yuma Arizona. All around me are strewn the artifacts of uh, the Hobo Kingdom, old uh, country time lemonade cans, uh, newspapers, beer bottles, an old crunched up air filter and a shoe, an old shirt and a smashed up barrel that's been uh, used for a campfire type of stove, uh, little bits, bits of cloth and feathers, dead pigeon, all strewn around there. But you know, uh, hobos seem to eat a lot of junk food. There's some chocolate chip ice cream and uh, ding-dongs and uh, <laughs> uh, what else, all kinds of other stuff. Here's one called Marshmallow Bunnies, an old package. And um, some of the graffiti, Hobo, Texas, Naked City, Soy Chapo, whatever that means. But uh, right now we're looking into the possibility of taking a train to Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's a six hour ride on the old freight. Uh, we don't really like the idea of riding the train because it gets so darn filthy and it's so noisy and hot, but um, our other option is to go back into town, uh, hit one of the bars on a Friday night, see how much money we can round up uh, doing caricatures, and then uh, catching the Greyhound bus to Flagstaff, which would get us a little farther north. So uh, right now Tom's checking to see what the driver's gonna gonna do, what his plans are, and uh, we'll soon see what uh, which way we're headed, north or, or plain straight east. What does a train say, Dan? Thank you. Thank you. But we didn't take a train, though, Dan. We took a bus. And while waiting in the bus station, I talked to this great old Indian fellow. Here he is. What's your name, sir? My name is Schlusler. Schlusler? L-U-T-H-E-R. Luther. Kern. Luther, Luther Kern. Yeah. Very happy to meet you, sir, and I hope you live another hundred years. So off we went to Flagstaff, Arizona, with dollar signs in our eyes. First night we spent in the Flagstaff College dorms, where Tom sang a little tune about our condition. <laughs> well, I've been down since I got in this town. <laughs> And I don't know why. I want to travel far, but I don't got no car. I want to meet Sharon, but it don't seem like she's caring about who I am. And my name ain't Tim. No, hello? Sharon? Yeah, Sharon. The big talk that night was the ball game over at the sports arena. So we headed on over. Pass completed at the 28 yard line to Rotter and Pinduel. Uh, that was a fine drive. What do you have to say about that, commentator? I think it, uh, we've got a fine team, a uh, fine effort, uh, wonderful uh, on the field behavior. Uh, ain't been nothing obscene. Uh, it's been nice. How do you account for the failure of the team to get together a good offensive effort? Uh, we've got a lack of talent. Uh, which what do you mean lack of talent? The boys wouldn't agree with you there. Well, we've been hindered by lack of talent this year, and uh, I feel that uh, that's probably hindered our effort uh, overall as a whole. So well, right now we're going to head over to the um, Santa Fe yards, see if we can't find a train uh, heading east out of here. We don't care whether it's a train, whether it's a truck or airplane. Whatever it is, it's going to take us east. Anyway, after that, we came back to the freight yard here. 
had some more chili and honey and stuff. And um, we uh, found this uh, train that set out, looks like it's set out and ready to go somewhere. But uh, uh, so we're sitting right now. We climbed up into this wood chip car. And uh, we're sitting in it right now. The sweet smell of wood chips is all around us. We're just slightly below the edge of the top of this thing. Um, and um, we have kind of a predicament because right now it looks like uh, if they are going to hitch some more cars onto the end of this train, they're going to have a problem because uh, Tom's playing around with the coupler and it slams shut and uh, it'll break off the coupler if they don't notice that it's closed, in which case they may search around here and find us and uh, kick us out, that's for sure, and send us to jail probably. We talked to this other hobo that was sitting by the side of the of the rails, and he said that uh, this town is really down on, on uh, vagrants. He came up to me as kind of cynical in a way. He was a little bit down on marriage, and he said, uh, you can't romanticize the hobo's lifestyle. And said, uh, this is kind of a tough town to hitch out of. It's hard to hitchhike at all. Um, so anyway, here we are. Sun is setting on top of the horizon. We're waving it around with a couple more hours of light, waiting for the train to hitch onto here because we really want to get going east. Perfect. Well, that train never did budge for us. It stayed on that yard for the whole time we were in Flagstaff. The only trains that did go through Flagstaff went through at about 50 miles an hour. And, uh, we thought of it, but there's no way we could have jumped onto the darn things. Tom had the idea, maybe we could throw our packs on and then jump on. But it was too big of a risk. And uh, when a train goes by, there's only this one handle and a, and a short stairway at the end of each car. Not enough to grab onto when it's going over about 15 miles an hour. So we headed on up to uh, Straw Hat Pizza, and we met these guys named Bob and Don, two retired truckers who were driving a Cadillac across country. They heard our story, got talking to them, and figured they had room in the back of their car. So they took us all the way to Wichita. What's the name of this town, Bob? Humidity is 80%. Skies are clear. It's we made it to degrees. Wichita. 53 degrees at 20 we got on radio. Seven o'clock. Okay. Now, Kathy, if you were only allowed one question, and you were interviewing two gentlemen who were trying to set the world record for hitchhiking across the country, what would the question be? Only one. Only one. Well, I would have a, a number of questions. Well, what would be the How first one? How heavy are their packs? How heavy are your packs? <laughs> heavy, enough, heavy enough to rule out the possibility of a, a world walking record. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, approximately 55 pounds each. Okay, we're getting talking, heavier too. Getting uh, heavier. We're, I didn't see them. Are they out there in the lobby? No, they're stored right now at your local Continental Trailways. Uh, well, that weight varies according to how much tuna fish we're carrying at the time. Uh, but. <laughs> Okay. Peanut butter. I, well, now, we were asking you how much this trip had cost you so far. You said five bucks a piece. How much is food costing you? Are you well, getting... I, okay, actually, uh, that figure is, is, as far as how much it's cost us, we've actually made uh, approximately $35 on the trip so far, and that's including expenditures in the past two weeks of about two hundred dollars so we, that's we make money by we make money as we uh, go portraits across the country in bars and that kind of thing where are you sleeping at night where are you sleeping at nights graveyards one time we, we slept, slept in a we slept in, in a, a graveyard <laughs> and i guarantee you people won't bother you there <laughs> another place we slept was the bike room of a university the university uh, dorm. Of, uh, of oregon northern oregon or something rooftops we slept on a rooftop once uh we slept on a car on a, a box car a grain car uh, it was full of wood chips is what it was. It was a train car full of wood chips. Flagstaff. Like wood chips. Like so. And that smelled so sweet. It was nice. Oh, that Doesn't was that sound exciting, Kathy? Yeah, but there was a full <laughs> moon that night. Don't you? A full moon, well, huh? it was two nights ago. It was Any almost ha full. hairy people running around howling at the uh, <laughs> Just uh, sky? No, my brother stayed home. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what, we'll talk with you two. We're talking to Tim Kincaid and Jim Gurney, in case you're wondering. Two guys that are trying to set the Guinness Book of World Records record 
for cross-country hitchhiking, 30,000 miles they're going for. In the meantime, we'll have to see if we can uh, figure out just exactly what we can do to get some free advertising. Maybe give them an FM 107 t-shirt and uh, broadcast across the country. Hill. We'll work on that one. 22 minutes until... Yep, there's the famous radio interview in Wichita. Now I want to do a whole separate tape on Wichita and uh, also on the other adventures we had in southern Missouri. There's so much material there that it really deserves another highlight tape. Briefly, we spent a week with Ma Kincaid down there in down there in Missouri and uh, had some real adventures. But at the end of that, we decided to head back to the rail yard. This is the first time we would have ridden the rails again since Yuma, Arizona. And let's take you right there to the rail yards outside of Missouri. We're on a train headed north out of Poplar Bluff, Missouri. The way we got on here was kind of a strange circumstance and one of the most exciting moments of our trip so far. We packed up our stuff, cleaned up the room yesterday, gone to see Leroy, went to play a couple snooker games. I'll tell you about that later. We knew we had to come down to Poplar Bluff to get a ride out. So we came down here with Tom's mother. She drove us. We stopped at the bank and the post office to mail off a box of stuff. As we were driving over the yard, we saw a train rolling. Please flip the tape. Big long freight headed north. The only reason we knew it was headed north is because of the direction of the shadows. And the water jug. We have no food, no water jug. But most of the food's packed, isn't it? Most of the food's packed in your pack, isn't it? All right. We saw the train rolling. Before we knew it, we said, take that road to the left, Ma. She went driving along. Streets just stopped on the dirt road. We jumped across trains. I thought it was going too fast to jump, and I barely made it up there without falling under it. We threw our packs on board and jumped it. I barely grabbed hold of the thing without falling into the wheels, but I got on. And here we are. Heading north, I hope. A guy down there who uh, was holding a suitcase, apparently a caboose man. He's going to jump on. He told us where it's headed. Des Moines, Illinois. Des Moines, Illinois is where this train's headed. We just hopped it because of the direction of the The next morning, after sleeping in a field of soybeans, we're riding aboard a big gondola full of uh, huge steel I-beams uh, on the way to St. Louis. We woke up this morning and stood up. We hadn't been harvested, luckily. We looked around as Lady mowing her lawn and everything. Uh, we got it all together and uh, walked down and had ourselves a donut and coffee and uh, went through a couple garage sales. Didn't find anything we needed. Uh, then we waited for a while for the rails, decided to walk down to the end of the yard, and uh, there we found this uh, old black guy who had worked for the railroad yards for 30 years, who was swinging a, a big mallet, driving a, a huge steel peg through a, um, what do you call it, a, through, what do you call that thing where the tracks separate, anyway, where the track join or whatever, but um, he let us swing the mallet some. We talked to him about his marriage. He said, uh, marriage is good if you got the right woman, but if you don't, there's no way of telling while she's, uh, while she's courting you. It's after you got the papers, then you find out, he said. Uh, so along came this train. We almost jumped the boxcar, but he signaled us to get off. The, the black guy did, as if signaling, taking a message from the conductor. But we got on anyway, missed the boxcar, but we got onto this gondola. It's uh, a very huge, rattly old thing with these gigantic beams, which had every shifting load, every bump in the track, bang together in uh, this incredible racket. But we're on the move again, and that's the best thing. Heading towards St. Louis. Above us, uh, there's a bridge crossing over. And uh, some, some construction workers. You can hear him riveting that bridge up there. 
kind of exposed here. Hopefully we can get into some other car because uh, we're afraid the dick might see us. We'll see what happens. You can hear that clattering sound. That's on a different car right now. It's a truck carrier, a flat car with a uh, with some tracks on it that uh, will hold the wheels of a, of a removed trailer from a truck. The train we were on before turned out to be uh, just a work train, the yard train, and it went on back into the yard and stopped for a while. This one pulled up, was blocked by the other one, and uh, we asked, talked to the engineer, and he said that this would be leaving out, going four or five miles to East St. Louis, and we could get to B&O going east out of there. So we hopped onto this thing. He sped up really quick. We had no idea he'd get moving so fast. And we were trying to hop on, and he slowed down for us. So he realized we were getting on. It was a real nice thing to do. So here we are. Uh, weather is overcast, uh, fairly warm, about 70 degrees. Did you hear the horn of the train there? Coming to a crossing here. Well, it's warm. We're very exposed on this thing, though. Uh, if the yard dig wants to get us, uh, we'll certainly be seen. So we'll try to play cool when we get there and hop off to this thing stop. So I'll get back with you later on, see how this works out. I talked to you. We faced a lot of danger. Uh, we were on that flat car, which took us a few miles, and um, we jumped off. The engineer told us. The B&O was a couple tracks farther on, um, on and to the right. So we headed off to the right. Immediately, this car comes up. And this guy flashes us his badge and says, uh, listen, where do you guys think you're going? He says, get on out of here. So we walk along the public road onto these other tracks, talk to a guy in the tower. First, the black guy down the lower part of the tower who was frying some sweet potatoes who and had the eyes going different directions told us uh, that you might be able to get some tracks up farther up that away. We went upstairs and talked to another guy who was standing in this room full of uh, switches and handles for the track switching. He told us just how to get there, walk about two miles along this uh, railroad causeway. So we walk along, and there's this other sedan pulled over, and this guy waves us over and asks us for identification. We thought we were arrested right there. His face was covered with worry lines. and. He seemed really concerned for us after a while. Instead of wanting to arrest us, he seemed to want to help us. There's a train going by above us here. A B and O. Oh, it's just it's just an engine. Okay. Um, but he drew us a map how to get there. He said, "Put your money in your shoe." Another guy said that later. Um, and he seemed really worried about us. Uh, so he made sure that we got onto this engine, this work train that was going in our direction. He hopped on that thing and rode it with these four guys, kind of joker guys, who drove us along. I was about our trip a little bit. And it was really neat sitting in the front of the engine looking out there. We hopped Riding in a train engine really was one of the highlights of that section of the trip. You're up there really high off the ground, about two stories up. Uh, a, an engine has windows on the front, sides, and back. And there's not much space inside, but a lot of green enamel painted controls and a big cooler full of beer right in the middle. Those guys really seem to drink a lot of beer on the job, about four guys joking around from up there. And from those windows of that big old red-painted work train engine, we could see what looked like a war zone of eastern St. Louis. There were old, a lot of brick buildings that had been overgrown by uh, green climbing vines. Uh, most of the houses were missing a wall or two, just collapsed. A lot of burnt uh, wood frame structures. It really did have a strange, eerie experience uh, riding in this steel fortress uh, through what people were telling us was an extremely dangerous area. Uh, we, we got to the outer fringes of this area and uh, on a variety of leads were given some tips on where a train might be headed east. Now you got to understand that this area of East St. Louis is a major switching yard. Uh, trains go north to Chicago, go uh, west from there. Uh, so you have literally hundreds of tracks, a, a network, complex network, and it's very difficult to know which trains are going where. So we depended on information 
of uh, people in these kind of God-forsaken little steel booths in the middle of nowhere in these yards who had some strange function of switching engines or of uh, setting up signals for the trains. Another thing about these yards is that uh, the employees who work in these yards are divided into two camps as far as the tramp is concerned. There are those who are, are very friendly and informative to people who are traveling on the rails. They're the guys who work in the cabooses, who are in charge of setting out cars as the train moves, and the guys in the switching towers who um, control the traffic of the trains. They're more than happy to tell you where the train is going, uh, which when it's going and where it's going, and the, all the information you need. But as you might have heard reference to the dicks or the bulls, which is the nickname for the um, security guards that are hired by um, the train companies, Conrail, for instance, uh, who travel around in unmarked cars looking for tramps. What they're afraid of, of course, is vandalism and um, uh, pilferage of, of some of the valuable stock that's on these cars. For example, on the auto carriers, um, you have a good $100,000 worth of uh, merchandise completely exposed to the elements and to uh, hitchhikers, those cars, you know, could be scratched or messed up with, or they even told us sometimes guys sit in these cars, are able to break into them and sit, <laughs> sit in the cars as they're in the auto carriers. So they're really um, very, very uh, intense about kicking people off. We were able to elude them, though, and on a couple of tips, we were told about a train which was actually going to Indianapolis. go on the way to Indianapolis. We took the money out of our shoes, <laughs> which we had hidden there for safety. We set down our big metal pipes, which we've been carrying with us for weapons. And now as I look outside, I see countryside, farmlands. Already, we already walked out of the city. There are no suburbs here. And I can see already that all the fear and paranoia and hatred the racial hatred we found in that city there have evaporated into thin air and we're again with the warm, friendly hospitality of the rural people. A moment somewhere, somewhere in the Illinois farmland country, maybe even Indiana farmland country, uh, we've been up on the roof, it's so shaky up there, it's impossible to read, go by a town, each of which has a tall grain silo seed store in the center of it. And uh, what we did was the ultimate. Just now we um, built a little kite out of a piece of cardboard with a reinforced triangular gusset at the top and a tail that was made out of a, a piece of plastic and a key taped on. And um, we made a, the rope, uh, the string was made out of a heavy twine. We let the thing go and it spun around. It actually went up fairly high for a while but uh, finally just blew apart from smashing into the train. But uh, I'm sure that flying a kite from a fast-moving freight train is one of the most unusual experiences on the trip. Riding on the roof of this three-story auto carrier, we were surprised to find out at first that this thing was very, very high. So high, in fact, that we have to duck way down to avoid hitting bridges. First, we were jumping up and down, facing backwards, we looked around just in time to see this huge bridge coming up at us at about 50 miles an hour. Um, so we hit the deck just in time. From now on, we've been from then on we were cautious, always looking ahead before we started to stand up. We ducked way down, and one was coming. But now we're having dinner, which consists of originally of uh, water, which tasted like rubberized bags. Um, a cold cream of mushroom soup can um, sprinkled on with some dry mug lunch soup mix with noodles and monosodium glutamate and salt, basically. And now we're eating some raw peanut butter and honey mixture, a month old, without spreading it on anything, just eating it straight. But it tastes fine to me, one of the best meals I've had so far because of how hungry I am. Yards. 
And uh, we looked around, walked on to the trim caboose in the back. No one was there. Looks like this is the end of the line for us. So we're going to see what kind of adventures we can find here in Dupo before we bed down for the night and catch a ride on farther. Each kind of car on a train uh, has its advantages and disadvantages for the tramp. The boxcar has the advantage of privacy and shelter from the elements, but in the hot summer sun, it's extremely, extremely hot. It's like being in a, an oven, literally. Uh, the gondola is okay, except for the fact that it's completely open on the top, so a lot of grime, grease, dust, junk comes flying in on you. Um, and um, you, it's easy to be seen from overpasses and things like that. There's basically no place to hide. Uh, they're also dangerous, especially if they're loaded. Uh, we were told uh, um, by one tramp that um, a brother of his was killed on a gondola that was loaded with lumber because the train uh, made a quick stop and all the lumber shifted forward and crushed him. But um, uh, on boxcars, we found that we could actually jump from the top of one to the top of another. You have to be very careful, though, not because of the distance of the gap in between, but because of the um, the fact that the train will make these sudden uh, jolts occasionally. What seems to happen is uh, the engine will slow down fairly suddenly, and then all of the couplers will compact. They are, they're spring-loaded, the couplers, so that um, if you stop fast, the one car will bunch up next to the other, and it'll send a shock wave back from the engine all the way to the very back of the train. You can hear it coming. You hear a bang, 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 and then it hits your car. And then you can hear it going all the way to the back of the train. And this builds up spring tension on the whole train so that when it pulls out from a stop, it has a little bit of um, mechanical advantage. But if you're standing up when that shock wave hits you, it'll knock you right over. And if you're about to jump, it'll make you lose balance. Um, but the auto carrier car is a good one. We were on an empty one. It's three stories with some paneling on the side for protection. And you can actually use the top deck for an observation or kite flying deck and uh, the middle deck for sleeping. The only problem is you have to change decks by going on an outside ladder. It's just a couple of metal loops that you can swing your body up to the top deck on. Um, and so you actually have to, as a train is running along at 50 miles an hour, you have to actually swing yourself out to this precarious perch and climb up on this ladder. Um, you also have to check ahead on the train to make sure that there's no signal lights coming up because they they come within about a couple feet of the train and you don't want to be leaning back um, from that ladder when you're passing by, uh, passing by there. Uh, another thing that we learned while riding on this leg of the journey was that um, some cars are known as square wheelers. That means that a section of one of the wheels may have been worn off and uh, generated a flat spot. And what this does is it creates this incessant rattling which um, makes the car unbearable to sleep on. We were on one of these and we couldn't switch. If you tried to lie down on a sleeping bag on the bare steel, it would actually bounce your body directly off the ground. So it's kind of hard to sleep. Um, we had another square wheeler earlier on the trip after we left Missouri, which was a flat car. Flat cars, of course, are the worst because you're totally exposed with no protection and, and no safety. Um, but we found out that if you have a string of flat cars, an experienced trainman can actually walk from flat car to flat car by stepping from the front of front edge of one onto the coupler and then on to the next car. It's about a three-foot step to the middle of the coupler and then another three-foot step to the next uh, to the next flat car. And the coupler, if you look at it closely, has a little metal step molded into it, designed, I guess, for doing this. We only tried that once with our backpacks on, which was really risky because it threw off our weight. But we were able to walk from car to car up to a gondola to get out of view. Uh, we were told to do this by a cabooseman who walked all the way up from the caboose and handed us a, gal a couple gallons of water in a kind gesture and uh, asked us to, to move so that the, uh, the the dick or the bull wouldn't uh, wouldn't see us. Let's continue. This next, next sequence tells a little bit of our arrest 
um, outside of Columbus, Ohio. Doing a test here on my old tape. Anything good? What's happening on this tape? How's the sound quality? Testing. The way to Philadelphia, but uh, things went from bad to worse. We were caught by the police who had, someone had reported us earlier. The guy stopped the train. The guy came up and waved his badge at us. I actually threw my sleeping bag down the wrong side and thought that we were trying to jump train. We got down there in time. We had eventually made him uh, a little more amenable to us and uh, he took us in his truck. We were cleared by the Williard, Columbus, uh, Williard Ohio Police and they uh, let us go. He actually drove us to an, a freeway on-ramp, which is a mixed blessing because uh, we're a long way from any kind of wash-up or, or eat-up station. We have to eat something here because we're kind of hungry. Before we can head on eat farther east, so we have a slight uh, wrench thrown into our plans here, but uh, it's about to rain here, and we're about six miles out of the nearest bus station. But, you know, does that phase us? No, not at all. Here's a little recollection of the arrest. Give us some free food or just support us get some who knows what, but the point is we're at ESW. Here we go. Morning time, 9 a.m. The train starts to slow down. You wonder why it's stopping. You're already just outside of town. You scamper down to the lower deck. Hide in your uh, sleeping bag. Then you look out through a crack of the train car. You see a man in a uniform running up the side from the, uh, from the freeway, running up the bank. He looks at you. Points at 45. Get off of there! All right, you, come on! Yeah, you, come on! At first, your instinct is to hide. You stand and look out. What's Matt? What's wrong? Come on, get everything off of there. The train stopped for you. They're, they've come to kick you off. It's a railroad bowl. <laughs> the ladder is only on the right. He's on the left. So you throw your stuff down. Don't be throwing it off that side. You can't get escape. You can't escape from here. As you're organizing your stuff, you hear him on the radio. Uh, please hold on to nine other units. Uh, we'd like to see the uh, good local Williamstown uh, Willard Police Department here. Uh, do you want to press charges? Press charges, he says. Uh, nine months in, uh, we have two riders here uh, uh, found on Indianapolis. Turn to the airport. He radios to the other police unit. Everywhere, from all around, come black cars squealing to a stop under the freeway underpass. They come up, look at your driver's license after you come down on the ground. You're covered with grime. You feel terrible. You look like a mess. You do your best job of explaining who you are. Finally, he concedes that you're okay. He calls off the other cops and asks whether he wants to the Willard police if they want to take us into custody. No, they say they have no charges against us. Mm. So we put our stuff in the back of the truck and he takes you out to the outskirts of town. And I mean the outskirts. Nobody for miles around you. There's no way of getting out. Well, that's where we were when we entered the town of Columbus, Ohio. That's where we were. We were on the Conrail train lines wanted list. Our names and addresses were written down. All Conrail employees were alerted to our presence. There's no way we could have continued our trip on the rails. We had to find another way. We tried a little hitchhiking. Of course, there was no chance. We looked like monsters, covered with filth and grime, standing on the off ramp. People just blew their eyebrows into the air when they saw us. So what did we do? We walked across the on ramp. I mean, across the overpass. We saw a little shack down there, and way beyond it, the Columbus skyline. Somebody told us it was about six miles into town. We knew we could never make it. So we walked up there, and it turned out to be a VFW post. And we had to change clothes to get in there, so we went into the front lawn of this guy's place and uh, just stripped down <laughs> and changed clothes while all these trucks were driving by. And we waited, we waited on the porch a little while before we went in because the place hadn't opened yet. And in there we had uh, some, uh, what was it, a meat patty, some kind, mashed potato.
And so I'll sign off for now, wishing everyone in the GP all the best.